going to ask you to imagine yourselves in North Africa, maybe um, Algeria or Morocco. The sky is clear. There's a hot, bright sun. But we're in an opening among stone buildings in the shade of a small plaza. There's a small, narrow monument near one corner, also of stone, about seven feet high. And at its base is a small pool of, of which water is trickling, the sound echoing off of the walls, and the drops of the water make patterns on the surface of the pool. The monument has six sides, each with a small protruding sculpture, a bust, a title, and a Latin inscription. So I'm going to get to this, the real monument later in the talk. Um, but since we're in a fantasy, I'm going to make up what it says on the inscription. And I'm also going to make up the translation from Latin. Patience, Effort, and Hope, those are the titles. The left-hand panel starts, I came here to work hard, to improve my knowledge and skills. The director sent me a very kind invitation, and so I traveled on land and through the air to be here, arriving just in time to begin my studies. Every day from morning to nighttime, I have been applying myself. It's fun, but it is not. And that's the end of the first panel. And the second panel starts easy. There are, are more books than grains of sand on the beach, and more bibliographies than books. And in four weeks' time, I must return to my country. What can I do? I relied on the spirit of others, and I kept my own eyes open. I made sure to refresh myself in the swimming pool, sleep and eat well. My hosts, that's the end of the second panel. The third panel starts, were very gracious. I followed suggestions from my colleagues. Some of them had spent their lives in these libraries and knew their way around. I also made my own systems and followed the logic of collections, made discoveries by looking beside and next to what I came for. What I found is inscribed, and that's the end of the third panel. And the, the back of this monument uh, doesn't exist. So that's as much as, it's as far as it goes. So um, good, we've got a slide. Water systems in ancient Greece and Rome, a research residency at Dunbarton Oaks, um, is maybe a bit of a dull title for a talk. And so I want to thank Jeff for inviting me <laughs> uh, to talk to you and to share my work. Um, I. S uh, I came into the work, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how I decided to go to Dumbarton Oaks, and then I'll give you a kind of a tour of what happened when I was there, and talk more about what kind of place it is. Um, so I was uh, interested in um, uh, curbs, actually, but that also had a function of a stormwater function, right? Um, this sort of edge of uh, the movement of people and the landscape or whatever's beside the road um, has a lot of different conditions. This is actually from Washington, D.C. Um, what started to interest me as I looked into it was, like, it's such a common thing. that like, You can study a curb wherever you are, <laughs> um, pretty much, um, but they're also actually kind of complex, what the materials are. There are certain standards, but there's a lot of variation. Um, they're used as um, communications devices, but also there are these kind of um, uh, not quite random ecological situations that will come up. This was in Berkeley, actually. Um, and these ducks 
hung out there, like for a week I would see them, certain times of the day. Um, there's a kind of a color coding thing that happens. Um, they can be really beautiful. Um, it's, uh, they can be layered with uh, kinds of information. And when you look at the curb from a um, stormwater point of view, where the road the gathers water and rather than sort of flood into the homes, there's this raised edge. Um, this is a um, map of the San Francisco. You can see Twin Peaks is over here, and Noe Valley. This is Noe Valley. So the color changes are the boundaries between the watersheds. If you could, if you could scrutinize the um, contour lines, you'd see water's flowing that way in the yellow and this way. Uh, in the purple, um, green lines are historic streams. And what this um, uh, map is showing is the dotted lines, which are the storm drain system. So looking at the Noe uh, Valley stream, this was Presita Creek. Um, water still flows downhill. It still flows um, t t out to the bay. <laughs> But instead of going in a kind of a wiggle, it goes in a zigzag. Um, so this stream still exists, but in a different condition. And so I, I became interested in this sort of above ground, below ground uh, situation. And uh, wanted to know what, what is a stream actually? How do streams function? And uh, so for the last three years, I've been working in the Sierra Nevada with stream ecologists. And I, um, this was kind of where that work started. I went up, uh, this is at Mono Pass, so the elevation is about 11,000 feet. Um, this is Mary Toothman. She's a frog. Uh, um, she's actually an epidemiologist. She's studying diseases in frogs, the chytrid fungus that's been devastating frog populations around the world and particularly in Yosemite. Hi, Sam. <laughs> um, so I went up there with her. We spent the day um, talking about art and science, and I helped her tag frogs. Uh, from Mary, I got to um, David Herbst's uh, laboratory. He works out of UC Santa Barbara. And David invited me into uh, stream surveys that his team was has been doing for, uh, this would be the ninth year this summer, um, but they're going to 24 different streams th throughout the Sierra and taking their vital signs so they can see how things change from year to year. Um, so here I am holding the clipboard and the tape measure. It's a stream survey is basically you like find out how wide it is and how deep it is and um, what else did we do? We collected, um, this is, uh, picking through, uh, it's called um, coarse, uh, P-O-M is um, particulate organic matter. Um, so organic matter in streams is one of the things that the stream invertebrates live on. And the amount of organic matter will determine the kind of things that you have in the stream. And from year to year, that changes. And as you might expect, it depends on having things along the sides of the streams where that are um, growing and letting their leaves down, leaves and wood. Um, we got into some of the most amazing landscapes in the Sierra, up and down the chain, and also looked really in, we were in the stream. Basically, a stream survey is about a four-hour uh, project. So we'd sometimes do two of them in a day, hike into one site, do a survey, collect our tools, get in the car, drive to another site, and do another survey, and then drive to a, another campground and do it all over again the next day. So they would do these um, surveys in bunches, um, like for a three, four days at a time, depending where, th where the sites were. Um, and I, so I had an underwater camera, and I was looking at these. These are black fly larvae that are like an adult black fly is, you know, a real pest to mammals, but the larva, which is most of the lifespan of the um, 
invertebrate um, is a filter feeder, right? So you have about a million of these guys in a hundred meters of um, stream, keeping the water clear. Right. So a very complex uh, system, as you might expect, but my opportunity here was to really to get inside uh, how those measurements are made, what are the pieces, how do the pieces relate to each other. I was doing some um, collection of algae, so find an average stone every 50 meters within our 150 meter reach of stream that we would study in each site. Scrape the stone of algae. The algae was brought back to a lab in a, like in a thermos full of ice, and the chlorophyll was analyzed. So depending on the amount of chlorophyll, that's also food for the invertebrates. The invertebrates are food for the fish. There's this whole kind of network where if one piece starts to tank, then it's going to pull on some of the other pieces. And the pieces are vulnerable in different ways to climate change, right? To rising temperature, uh, to a drought that lowers the um, water levels in the streams and so on. Uh, some of the streams that we went to, this is where we start the survey by stretching out a 150 meters of um, measuring tape so we can tell where we're taking measurements. And I don't know if you can see, but there's no water <laughs> there. The stream was not a stream in the first 35 meters of the reach. So th they go back to the same place every time so that they're comparing uh, the stream from year to year. Uh, and further up, yes, there was water flowing. And it eventually like, got less and less, and it went into the ground. And of course, a stream, we call it a stream. We think it's the part you know, from the bottom of the air <laughs> to the top of the rocks. But actually, there's, um, you have a stream flowing in the substrate as well. It flows more slowly because it's pushing through the rocks, but there's, there's still stream flow there. And there's a whole kind of life system going on in the substrate as well, uh, uh, particular animals and uh, bacteria, microorganisms that are living um, in the darkness there. It's a very stable environment, as you can imagine. I also worked with um, other researchers. This is Melissa Thaw, who's studying how uh, water moves through uh, what's called um, the critical zone. So this is kind of, to me, a new scientific term. But the critical zone is from the uh, sky, <laughs> to fr from the treetops, essentially, to the water table. Um, it's the zone where 99.9% where of life happens, critical zone. So there's a UC Merced has a critical zone observatory in the southern Sierra, southwest Sierra. And Melissa is studying, she's a grad student there, she's studying um, how water moves from, when it comes down from the sky, a rainstorm will have a particular signature. So we think, well, water is H2O, but there are isotopes of water. An isotope is a, a um, atom with a different charge. It can be a little extra or a little <laughs> less, extra protons. Um, and there's people have tools for figuring out, like for separating the isotopes in a bucket of water or a sample, small sample of water. And so when you collect a rainstorm, you can see, oh, the isotope signature is like this. There's so many heavier uh, atoms, so many lighter atoms, and there's a chart like this. And so you can follow that signature as uh, collected as rainfall. Here uh, we're sampling from tubes that are um, in the groundwater in a meadow, right? So again, water's moving underneath the ground through the meadow. It's also going up um, into the trees and back out into the sky. So when I ask about, like, I was started with a gutter, I want to know how streams work. Now I'm kind of on the hook for the whole system how water moves. Um, this was a, a um, place at a um, research reserve that um, University of California has um, near Mammoth Lakes. 
Some of you are skiers. You might know that place. And um, what they have set up in the 1980s, they, um, you might say, like, I want this for my landscape design. <laughs> right? These are experimental streams. They are, there's nine identical zigzag streams. So it's not a natural stream. They can control the flow between each of the streams. There's a little um, sort of a um, gate there. And so they can test um, and make these parallel tests between, like if you have a lot of water moving through or just a little water moving through um, and, and various things in between. So they've been doing experiments on fish, invertebrates, algae, the kinds of things we were studying in natural streams. Another experimental landscape, uh, this is the snow um, lab, Central Sierra Snow Lab, which is up near Lake Tahoe. And I went there in the summer. Um, there have been some winters recently where it also looks <laughs> like this. Um, but normally you have snow up to, this is, a, this is about 20 feet high, these instruments. So the instrumentation, right? How do we ask questions? How do we, how do we gather information about, in this case, they want to know the water content of snow. Um, out of this work, I got involved in a uh, database that the U.S. Geologic Survey has. It's a hydrologic database. It's um, GIS data points for all the surface waters in the United States. And I've, over the last two years, actually, I've been working with this data to make silkscreen prints. I've just finished a set of three prints that are representing this, this is the sort of um, data that I download. That's Hetch Hetchy um, Reservoir. And these are the flow lines for the stream. So it doesn't tell you if it's a big stream or a little one. It just tells you there is water there. Um, this is the source of um, drinking water, the watershed, for the um, cities in the East Bay. And uh, this is Party Reservoir. So I'm trying to give us an image of these large-scale systems that are actually like come out at the tap <laughs> and there's some water over there. So this, so I learned a lot about um, uh, s natural streams, mountain processes, um, and I didn't really know much about like the curb and gutter thing. I could observe it in, in the cities, you know, where I was. But I wanted to have a similar kind of field work around the history development of um, water in, in urban areas. And uh, the curb is one piece of that that has to do with um, drainage. But there, there are these other pieces that have to do with the delivery of water, like um, what I was showing in the drinking water uh, examples. And so, um, that was my proposal to, um, uh, to Dunbarton Oaks. Um, and this is the main house there. Um, but I just wanted to read you a little a piece of my proposal, because I think maybe it gives you a flavor of how I was directing my uh, intentions. Uh, urban waters follow the same basic laws of mountain streams and floodplain meanders yet they are constrained by entirely different shapes, quantities, materials, temporal and social frames. Those conditions go back to the earliest irrigation, potable water, spectacle, and sewage systems that co-evolved with transportation structures and human modifications of topography. During the 20th century, massive water infrastructure and paradigms of control were consolidated while advances in recent decades integrate water with designs for roadways, plazas, and buildings. So that's like contemporary landscape <laughs> architecture. Climate instability coupled with aging infrastructure now challenge designers as well as citizens to understand water's dynamics across disciplines and scales. I see the research center as a complementary space to ecological field stations, a field station for immersive scholarship. Access to materials and a focused period of research and reflection 
will advance an understanding of this nexus and find expression in an artwork in progress. Okay, so you kind of have to like say, here's the problem and here's why this institution is where I can like advance my solution to the problem. So uh, yeah, so I, um, there's a lot of ways to um, uh, be at Dunbarton Oaks. This is the backside of that building. So it's, a, it's quite a grand uh, place. Um, and uh, I was actually there on a four-month research grant. Uh, sorry, four months, four weeks. I wish it were four months. Um, so they have fellows um, who are there for either an academic semester or an academic year. Um, and they have, they get, you get an apartment, there are certain obligations um, and privileges. Um, they, there are senior scholars who can come, like somebody was there for a week to work on a book chapter. Others um, were there, uh, had, had been there, like one had been the director, <laughs> right? And he'd been there 11 times as a visiting scholar. Um, and uh, they also have interns, internships. Um, so what, um, what I would say about it, let's see, um, okay, so, the, so Dumbarton Oaks, to give you kind of the broad view, um, is, uh, was established by two very wealthy people, Mildred and um, Robert Wood Bliss. Um, they were very interested in the humanities as a field of, of inquiry. Uh, and they were great collectors of art and artifacts. Um, uh, Robert Bliss was an um, ambassador, to a United States ambassador, so they got to travel a lot. And um, they uh, bought this property and built out the house um, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and it w so being there, and then they, uh, in the 40s, so they, this was in the 20s, that they established the house. In the 40s, they gifted the house and the collections to Harvard University. And uh, they still occupied uh, the site in, into the um, 1960s. Uh, and there's three areas of study there that are based on the collection that they uh, uh, acquired. Um, the Byzantine art, which is this sort of period um, uh, uh, it's actually a little sort of contested what the Byzantine period is, um, but it's like the Middle Ages backwards in tor toward the end of the Roman Empire, so 300 to 1300, roughly a thousand years. Um, garden and landscape studies, which is based on the um, work that they did on the property, so they have a quite an extraordinary garden, and uh, and collection of garden documents, books, and things, um, and pre-Columbian art. So again, there's a dedicated museum to Byzantine art, another one uh, designed by a building designed by Philip Johnson um, for the pre-Columbian collection, extraordinary building. Um, and the collection in the library is um, si uh, similar, uh, fo follows those topics. Um, so the, it was a little bit like, um, you know, being invited to the, to the king's house and, but they're away and so we got to kind of play <laughs> there. We had, we were able to use the pool. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, this is a picture of the library building. This is a reading room that's sort of built on. The library is five floors. One floor is, um, visual materials and then there's, uh, four floors of books. Um, there's a, this is maybe a little hard to see from back there, the pathway through the woods um, where I would come and go from. Um, but mostly I was here, right? Um, I don't know the number of volumes, but I can say that, um, you know, in this sort of wide ranging research that I did, I would um, look for a book. It would be, somewhere in the um, stacks. I'd go down and get it, look through the essays that I wanted to read, um, find something in a footnote that I wanted, look it up, and then go and get that book. 
and over and over, there were very few books that actually they, uh, that I wanted that they didn't have. <laughs> um, there's a whole floor of folios where, you know, books that are kind of too big to stack on a shelf. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, there's some um, Byzantine frescoes <laughs> along the wall, um, wonderful light. Um, and the system uh, for study is you go find a book that you want and you put an out card in the book. You write your name um, and the, the call number of the book and the date. And then you put that in and you take the book out. So should somebody else want the book, they go to look for it and they see, oh, Todd's got the book. And they can put a request or they can go to my shelf. So I, I had a shelf where I could keep the books that I was working on. Um, and then borrow it from me and <laughs> put an out card there. So apparently they, it's rare that there's really fights over individual books. Um, as a fellow, you get an office to work in. Um, f as a, a f um, on a four-week research grant, I had the run of the library to kind of choose whatever empty desk I wanted. And most of them, they were rarely filled, actually, because the, fel the fellows all had offices. So I had a corner space overlooking the woodland uh, spot for my computer. Um, I could spread out along the shelf, drawing supplies, whatever I needed. There were um, copy machines for scanning things. And um, basically what I did was to keep a um, bibliography. This is one page from uh, a um, database that I set up for myself um, with uh, the author's names. The color coding is sort of helps me keep track of what I've read or what you know, was exceptional. There's also some notes and the, and the title. So I could like rearrange if I was trying to search for something by title. Um, I wound up with about a thousand pages of scanned material um, that I'm now kind of slowly reading <laughs> through. Uh, but only having four weeks, I, I knew that I needed to just like gather as much as I could. And I would read enough uh, to know that I wanted to read the whole thing carefully. I'd make a scan of the uh, book chapter or essay. Uh, in some cases, it was photographs. And in some cases, I would just like, this is a shelf of, um, it's, well, you, what you can't see there is there's four or five languages just in this short bit of shelf. These are, um, so there's Shinto in history, um, the secret of the golden flower. This is a German book about um, old is, uh, religions in uh, Iran. And there's some books in, in Chinese or Japanese over here. So whatever applies, regardless of language, they're collecting those books, or they had collected them. They're continuing to um, gather. And so sometimes I would just like, oh, I don't have time to <laughs> get into this, but there's some interesting things here. I'd take a photograph of the shelf of the spines of the book. Um, there were also some large, a uh, few large tables. And so I, I was um, printing out images from, uh, from my own work and could spread them all out on the table and kind of look at what's related to what. Uh, so what was I looking at? Um, these are some pictures of contemporary things. Um, my emphasis was on the ancient world, but I was also interested in how contemporary designers are approaching these problems. What's, what's being um, kind of tur turned uh, in, the, uh, in the design world in the last 20, 50 years? Um, and so Herbert Dreisaitl, you might have heard his name. Um, these are uh, low impact development um, bioswales, uh, a, a kind of a new uh, relationship, say, between where the conventional curb, gutter, street, where the stormwater goes down into a storm drain and disappears, right? So, um, and then 
I'm, I'm really interested in this question of communication, right? How do we know what's happening? Do we know? Is it hidden? Um, so like you can have a sign that says waterfall wall um, that explains the process. Um, this is a, quite a remarkable book. A um, uh, bunch of authors in, in uh, Europe who put together, it's actually, it opens this original, um, the original edition had opens doubly, like you open the book this way and then each side opens. And so on the one side, the first volume, so to say, has the theoretical um, approaches and the second uh, side has the case studies. And, you and they're cross-referenced. So for example, this is, um, the, all of the graphics are consistent through the book. Um, and what they're basically tr addressing is uh, rivers are dynamic systems, which I knew very well from the Sierra. But they're looking at urban uh, conditions and how when you have a river that floods, uh, sometimes unpredictably, how do you design with that? And so there's this two-volume book that goes through a whole suite of possibilities. Um, in this case, this is just w a piece of one of the pages where they're showing, uh, okay, here's, you have a river, this is the usual level, the flood level, you can have agriculture, you can have camping and caravan sites, you can have event grounds. So under temporary flood conditions, all of those uh, uses would, would be um, fine. Um, so this was one of the books that uh, actually I came back and I said, I, I need to have this book. Um, mostly I just have like uh, PDFs. <laughs> Uh, okay, but to go to the ancient uh, world or the, um, to look uh, much further back in time, uh, what I'm going to do is go through a kind of um, list of uh, the pieces. Um, this is a um, map, of an aerial photograph of uh, Paris, a piece of Paris. And what um, the authors have done is to, sh to research the um, ancient conditions, the meanders, or what they call our, uh, they call them paleo meanders of the, of the sand. So the sand used to, you know, uh, like in a low lying place, the river will change its course over time. Here, uh, there was a bend that went up this way. And um, what, the, uh, what the research shows is how those streets were originally established later in time because it was a swampy area. They had certain uses. They were late to be developed. And so this is a sort of a time graph of when housing was established along those streets. Now that, um, that arc is uh, here. And it, so there's still this trace of the meander of the river. Well, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't feel it. Um, at the ground, but um, it's, it's built into the city, so to say, the, uh, the process of the river. Um, one of another author that, um, whose work really stood out for me, Catherine uh, Rin, did a lot of work on uh, the water systems in uh, Rome. So there's the very careful topographic map of Rome, and she's looking, th this is, um, again, difficult to see, but uh, she has her companion stand next to the flood lines of different parts of the city. So water finds its level, right? So when you have a flood, the flood of 1890 came to a certain level on the buildings. It marked the buildings. And so they actually have these um, marble, like incised plaques that show like where these floods were. And if you take that level, you start to see the hydrology of the city, how it functions. And this was, um, this was very important before there were motors to pump water around. When water was gravity fed, you had, to, you had no choice but to work with um, your, your, water, your gravity water pressure. Okay, other, another piece had to do with, um, in one case, traffic. Um, traffic, this is a, um, was an essay, traffic, con traffic and congestion in the Roman Empire. 
right? So this is a very old problem. <laughs> um, but what, what you see clearly is this hierarchy of roads, right? So main roads, secondary roads, um, how you direct uh, human traffic. And the same thing as a basic principle to how humans have directed the flow of water. We've established weirs. Uh, you create a small dam. It backs the water up behind the dam. You then have water pressure where you can uh, pull water off of the main stream and run it through a water wheel and create power. Right? So these are, I'm looking at these as kind of parallel systems. Um, there's a, uh, sort of a fundamental water source, which is the spring. And, um, I think mythologically it's probably, uh, maybe the most potent source of water, that water emerging from the ground, like this clear, cold water, this, especially in the Mediterranean. Uh, area where, like, you have a hot climate, um, water is an essential thing, and the sort of the magic of water emerging from the ground. Um, th in this case, this this um, is a di diagrammatic of how uh, groundwater would be collected or harvested, where you'd have an overhang or a cut into the earth, and some steps going down. And so, like, the gr you have groundwater moving through uh, the earth if where, where you have the cut. Sometimes you see this in a road cut, um, that water is coming out of the side of the road cut, right? Because it's coming through the earth. And so they have a pool at the bottom, steps to go down into the pool. Um, in other cases, that, uh, that wall would be articulated or celebrated, and so began this process of creating a uh, spring, spring house or a, um, what was uh, called in, in some cases a nymphaeum, okay, where the nymphs live. Um, and this, uh, we, there's, it's not uncommon to have the water spout articulated as an animal's head. Um, and the word kalaroa in, to, in Greek here, um, I, th I up until two days ago when I read in another one of the essays, um, I thought it was a specific place in Athens. And there is some like speculation. Nobody really agrees where it is. But it also refers to a spring, some place where water comes out. Um, again, from uh, Catherine Rin's study of the water uh, systems in Rome, the articulation of the drop of water into a pool, the boundaries of the pool reflective of an enclosure like a grotto uh, or a, a nymphaeum, um, also perhaps echoed in architecture, like where you have an apse, right? This sort of enclosure. Um, all of these forms are things that are patterned through architecture, landscape, the, ex the human experience of, of safety, enclosure. Um, uh, there, there was also um, some records of what happens in the nymphaeum, that, th that it's a female um, uh, zone, that like women use that space in ways that, uh, that they're th to behave in ways that they don't in public. It's not a ma it's not a masculine space, so this is um, again you have to ask like well how do we how do we know these things <laughs> this, is, this is we're talking like the Hellenic period was to 2,500 years ago, right? So we ha there's there's textual records there's um, illustrations, right? Um, uh, but we have to also compare and question. You know, are people making this up? Is it their fantasy? <laughs> are they changing the text um, to suit their particular agendas? Uh, and so even, you know, something as fundamental as how do you bring water to your mouth? How do you move it from 
the spring to your house. Um, these are parts of the process of, art of articulating water, what water is about. The sound of water, right? So this is, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, this is at Dunbarton Oaks. There's, uh, they have a bunch of fountains. And um, there's some conjecture, I guess, like I would say, that the in the uh, Roman pre-Roman period, that the there was very there were very specific sounds assigned to the uh, image from which the water emerged. Okay, and so we have to think about a culture where there are no machines, no machine noise, no humming lights, computers, cars. The, the sense of, of hearing would be different. And um, uh, so one could imagine that like the splash of water, when we can see it, it comes out differently from the horn than from the horse's mouth. That there would be this sense that it would, it would almost be like cinema, like their version of you know, the sound and image thing. Um, water delivery systems were essential. Um, and those delivery systems, um, we think of you know, the Roman aqueducts, I think, is kind of the major thing that we see. But most of uh, the delivery pipelines were underground um, in all manner of construction, according to the kind of rock they were going through, the kind of um, uh, terrain. And you had uh, profiles like these where the water would fill up this way, but people could get along in the tunnels to clean out or, s or service the aqueducts. And so we come to the six-sided monument, um, which uh, stood for me like uh, there was one day where I opened a book to this page and I thought, that is so amazing. Like, uh, what does it say? <laughs> what is it? And this was a book in Italian. My Italian is just good enough to like read, uh, to know like I really you know want to know more about this, right? I, I knew what the content was, um, but I don't read um, uh, first century Latin. And uh, but at the at the little coffee station where people like would take you know a coffee in the afternoon, I ran into uh, the Maguires. Henry and Eunice Maguire are Byzantine scholars that are like have an ancient history at Dumbarton Oaks. <laughs> and I asked Henry, like, do you, do you know anyone who could help me with this? And Henry got as far as the name in the, f in the first, like he could decipher the, the first few words to find the name of the um, person that this was about. And from there, he found the translation online, right? And so, um, since I was teasing you, you know, at the beginning about making this up, now I'll give you the real story, or piece of it. Um, and it does, it has six sides, but the back three sides are missing. So you get like three fragments, uh, and it's basically. Um, well, I'll just I'll just read the. Uh, the part. So the title is Patience. And uh, part of it says, I set out and en route endured brigands. I escaped naked and wounded with my men. I came to Saldea and met Clemens the procurator. He took me to the mountain where they were lamenting their tunnel of uncertain workmanship on the grounds that they thought it would have to be abandoned because the excavation of the work of the tunnel had been made longer than the width of the mountain. It became clear that the passages had departed from a straight line to the extent that the upper passage made for, and then there's a, you have to go to the next panel, which is virtue, made for the right toward the south, and the lower passage similar, similarly made for its right toward the north. Therefore, the two parts, having left the straight line, we're missing each other. So this is a this sort of mysterious object is a record of the digging of a aqueduct, 
for the town of Saldea. And they dug, they had two teams digging from either side of the mountain. And they knew how long it was from one point to the other. And th this team had dug a certain amount, and this team had dug a certain amount, and it was longer than the mountain. So they knew they were passing each other, but they weren't sure like what to do. So they called the engineer back. And on his way, he got robbed and lost his clothes, and, um, but he made it. And so the rest of the text goes on about like his um, story of uh, setting things right, that he came back to the, to the work site and got them to like, figure it out. And he actually set up a contest between the naval, um, so the soldiers and the mercenaries to like, see who could dig more. Um, and so essentially, um, in this period, if you are responsible for uh, work of engineering and it doesn't work out, you, you're in serious trouble, right? And so here's this kind of um, modest, uh, almost like a complaint about the hardships that he endured. But it monumentalizes the, you know, this small success for a, a little town in North Africa. Uh, this is the monument today. And what I did was I made a typographic um, version in English so I could actually like see how it how it read, how the how the breaks went. Um, so that's uh, water delivery systems. On the drainage side, this is a street in Pompeii. So already uh, you have Pompeii was um, the first century. Uh, and um, you have curbs. These are, these are stepping stones, but they're spaced uh, so that a, a cart wheel can go through, right? Um, Pompeii was, uh, the site of Pompeii has a slight slope to it. So they were, it was easy to get the water out as long as they had the streets, you know, pointed the right direction. Um, in 1900, uh, there's a very interesting book that is actually, this was, I think it's um, a Google book online. There's like some of the resources I got were just available online. Um, where, you know, in 1900, there, cars were not around. These were still talking about horse carts and pedestrians and, hor and horseback horses. Um, this is a uh, Roman uh, construction, road construction, again with uh, curbs um, and a crowned road surface, right? Because you don't, the main thing is you don't want to be in the mud and you don't want um, the water to infiltrate your road base. That's we're dealing with the same things today because physical physicality hasn't changed <laughs> a bit. Um, the, there was, you know, continuing innovation around what do you then do with the water? How do you how do you gather it and get it away? And every place is a little bit different. Um, this is from the same book uh, where it's showing the the section of the road and a drain, an under drain down here. So you have water uh, coming into this gravel base that has a way to get out so that it's not filling up and floating your uh, road surface away. Um, some of the crazy um, machines that, like, what, what was interesting was to be able to look at the evolution of, of these processes because it's easy to take them for granted. Um, and then to, to step back again to the ancient world, um, there was a kind of a central uh, 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 myth or idea um, about rivers. Uh, the river god Achelous was um, often portrayed as a bull. So here's Achelous. This is a nymph, the nymph of the particular river. So Achelous was kind of a general god uh, of rivers. 
and nymphs were specific to particular places. Um, they were, there's also a, they're also called naiads. So in stream ecology, stream invertebrates, the larvae are naiads. So this is like modern science is borrowing this observation that there is something in a stream <laughs> that we can't see that's going on. And the Greeks named it naiad or nymph. And uh, so that uh, perspective, that the word, was borrowed by modern science to describe the uh, larval stage of the insects. So stream insects have a larval stage that's uh, underwater. And then as adults, uh, not all of them, but many will emerge from the water and have a flying stage, which is the stage that we usually think of. Dragonflies are an example. Um, there's some very curious things here. There's a little figure down here. I don't know what's going on. It might have a, they might have a torch. And there's what looks to me like an insect. They are like a, a spider. Um, but again, these are, these are like nuances in a very, like people build their scholarly careers around numismatics, right? Around the study of coins, ancient coins. Um, so the story about Achilles is that uh, Hercules, uh, he, he, they, Hercules and Achilles had a, a fight over there was a, somebody's daughter as a bride, right? And so they were decided they were going to wrestle for this bride. And uh, they got into, uh, in this case, Achilles is um, shown as a horned serpent. Okay, so bull, snake. You can think of rivers as having like the power of a bull, water, and the kind of sinuosity of a snake. So again, it's like it's a communication thing. How do we image water systems, water processes? So Hercules broke the one of the horns off of Achilles and so won the fight. Uh, he, he got the bride. Um, that's the, not exactly the end of the story because <laughs> he lost her when he was crossing a river. Uh, a little later on, but um, what uh, what is curious to me is that uh, Oculus still has one horn. Right, so in this kind of tension between control of water and the dynamics of water, our dependency on water, that uh, water still has a horn. <laughs> we have we have our ways too. Um, so I th uh, I think I should leave it there. Um, and the, I'll say that the research left me with a lot of questions. I'm, I'm in the middle of it, so you can probably tell. Um, but my, I'm really more interested in your questions right now. So, so open it up for questions. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, just right out of the chute here? Yes, Philip. <laughs> so, um, your research into the past, our past water systems, where does that lead you um, towards the future? Yeah, it's, so um, it's a great question. Um, I think there's two parts, at least, to the answer. One is, um, you know, the future of water is. Um, uh, really volatile right now, right? We don't know, uh, we kind of know where things are going in terms of the changes of seasons, the uh, changes of temperature, changes in rain, rainfall. Um, we don't know really how fast that's happening. We also know that um, there's more and more people, at least in California and certainly on the planet, um, that need water. Um, so there's that side. The other side is um, where does where does this information sit with me, right? What is like a personal uh, trend for for myself? What are the things of all of these factors that are kind of floating up toward the top that continue to like call to me? And I I don't know the answer to that yet. 
I'm still, I think, I'm still in this phase of, like at home I have most of these images on a wall. They're all just like copies, you know, photocopies on the wall. And they're just there, you know, part of um, uh, my sort of everyday life. So, um, so that's the other part, is just to kind of wait and see, like, w what remains, you know, or what are the connections that start to uh, really uh, stick to me. Is this a different process for you than other projects where it, this seems very open-ended and you're not sh quite sure where it's going to lead, mm -hmm. so you're processing it over a period of time yeah. um, versus, um, I mean, I know you've done projects that were goal-oriented in the sense that there was a outcome you were looking right. for. Yeah, so um, this, the, you know, the, the work with water keeps, you know, like meandering, <laughs> right? It keeps splitting um, into new uh, areas of investigation, as I think it should, right? If, if I'm going to um, really understand this thing, I need to, you know, look at it as, look at water as snow, look at water as drinking water, look at water as habitat, you know, for, for algae. Um, and in, in this kind of, you know, spirograph <laughs> uh, activity, um, I, I can make connections so that the investigation becomes richer and richer. So, uh, for example, like, I got to this point with um, the streams ecologists where I wanted to know where we were, where is this reach of stream in relation to upstream and downstream? Is this, are we going to drink this water like that we're putting our yardsticks in? And, and how long, you know, <laughs> like is that going to be two days later or two weeks later? Um, and the same is true, um, so, uh, you know, I started to look at the, um, the uh, hydrologic database. And two years later, I have these prints. Right, and so um, that's another talk. Is like the next stage of the artwork, um, but it's kind of how like each piece has an opportunity to mature into some form. But I'm, but it's still a very mobile, you know. It's it's uh, really alive. Well, one of the things that's interesting to me about um, listening to artists talk is that they ask different questions often about the same things that everyday people we take for granted. So for example, the curb, um, you know, just dealing with mm -hmm. curbs for 25 years in my career. Um, you know, you feel like you've seen them, you know what they do. Yes, they divide traffic and pedestrians and um, channel storm water. And we, you know, we process that as part of the workflow and, and uh, analytical processes of what we're doing. But you ask the question differently. You're like, well, what is a, what really is a curb? You know, you, mm. it's kind of like it slows, everything gets slowed down, and there's, or even water. You know, what really is water? You know, we're all we're very concerned about how to manage water, how to deliver water, how to make sure it's clean. But just asking the question, you know, well, what is it real? What is it? How does it function? What are the hydrological mm. cycles? And then the historical. Uh, kind of touchstones, like I thought that thing in Paris was actually really interesting, that there were yeah. areas that were developed later um, because of the water systems that were there, but then eventually covered up. But there's still a remnants in the built environment because mm -hmm. of the way you know, it evolved. And so you have these historical references and meanings. So I, I mm -hmm. find it really interesting. And mm -hmm. um, these perspectives are what I think about is great about having you here, actually, is you, you really bring a unique um, perspective. Mm -hmm. Do we have other questions? Yes, Amanda. Um, <laughs> so in context of you having like all this interesting artwork, like the like Hercules and, and the, the snake, horn snake, um, what are you hoping to possibly gain from that? Is it just like a, a sense of like, OK, this is how they could use water at the time, and maybe how we could sort of use it in the Mm-hmm, 
can you summarize that real quick yeah, for the people so, online? So the, <laughs> I think Amanda's question was, what, am I, what do I hope to understand from the images, these ancient images? Uh, or how, how am I working with them? So uh, my sense, and I, I, I'm not the one to make this up. I think there's a lot of people working in this area of mythology, right? Um, how uh, these ancient structures uh, remain as a kind of an underlay to contemporary, our contemporary lives. So we, just like we, you know, have put water underground in pipes, but it still flows, you know, from the high point to the low point. Um, this uh, uh, vitality or um, embodiment that water has, that rivers have, um, that, like in the case of Hercules, you know, there's this idea of like strength. What is strength, right? It's a kind of a fundamental principle, almost. But the, you know, in the in that era, there was a image. It was imaged as her as Hercules. Um, so. I want to remember that that still exists and to work in contemporary circumstances with that fundamental thing. Uh, so having, like, that's an amazing bit of graphic design, actually, that uh, the pottery piece. If you kind of, I'm sorry the projector wasn't working, but the way the two figures are interlaced also tells us something about relationship, relationship of these two forces, what we would say like the human force and the, in that case, animal, but it's actually water, right? We, we didn't know, we humans, the Greeks, didn't know, you can't, like water is this very elusive thing, right? It's clear, it's formless, <laughs> it's only visible because of the thing that contains it or the thing that's in it, right? And so we make it visible in these particular ways, right? By having fountains that splash and, you know, lighting the fountains in certain ways. Um, so there's like just, you know, to, to the images are inspiring and they're also, um, you know, full of opportunities for understanding relationships and, and to bring that can be brought forward. Yeah. Cool.